So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Lisa Jane Degara. I'm so sorry that I'm not able to join you in person at Metropolis, um, but I've had the pleasure of presenting the section about emerging trends. Um, I wanted to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the larger scale 50,000 foot view realities that are really critical and key to understanding supports for K-12 students in Canadian schools who are of a newcomer background. One of the biggest challenges, and I think one of the biggest opportunities as well, is that there has been a massive shift in demographics um, associated with immigration across, uh, across the country. So this is a graphic that was uh, generated by Statistics Canada. I think this was published in uh, late 2022. Um, and as you can see, what we're looking at is a really significant shift in the proportion of Canada's population that is made up of immigrants. So we previously had a generationally high proportion of immigrants in the early 20th century, the sort of settlement of the prairies era, um, the period between the First and Second World War. After the Second World War with the baby boom, there was a really significant decline in um, total immigrant volume and also policies and understandings of immigration shifted substantially. One of the things that we noticed, though, is that looking into the early 2000s and then accelerating rapidly uh, to 2021 with um, anticipated increases beyond, we know that the population of Canadians uh, within the country is aging rapidly. The baby boomers are aging. Canadians are having fewer and fewer children. And we're increasingly seeing immigration not only as a necessary step in protecting our economic interests in Canada, but also as a really integral part of the way we think about generational planning for the country. When you look at a number like that, it begins to come into pretty sharp focus that it's not simply a matter of supporting immigrants as a matter of um, incidental support or occasional support or kind of a special interest. Increasingly, this becomes clear that we're dealing with a shift in the Canadian population. One of the other things that's really important to note on this graph is that that 34% that we're potentially looking at in 2041, that's across the entire life cycle from infants to the elderly. When you look at children under the age of 15, um, you begin to see a, a number that's closer to 50%. So in other words, the picture of the median Canadian child is changing substantially. Compared to 1990, in classrooms today, in 2023, the median child is much more likely to be a newcomer or the child of a newcomer, a first-generation Canadian. They're much more likely to be racialized, and they're much more likely to speak a non-official language at home. If you look at the major metropolitan areas of any city across the country, you'll notice a significant increase in people who report speaking a non-official language, which is to say neither English nor French, um, at home. We've seen really significant growth in Mandarin, in Punjabi, in Tagalog, um, in Arabic, in a variety of different languages across the country. And when we compare that with the data about the proportion of newcomers and the proportion of uh, children, that are uh, children of newcomers, we begin to see a very different face, and a very different vision of who is the median Canadian child and what services will they require. One of the things that I think about often as a manager of a rural Swiss program is Swiss has largely been established in major cities. It's predominantly been supporting newcomers in, um, in major cities because overwhelmingly that's been where major, um, newcomers have happened to settle. Um, my understanding is that 71% of newcomers settle in the metropolitan areas of either Toronto or Vancouver. Um, I saw a CBC report earlier this week that 20% of the Toronto Public School Division is... Um, from is a person of Indian descent. So we're seeing really significant um, demographic shifts of newcomers in our biggest metropolitan school divisions, but we're also seeing similar shifts, even on a lower scale and a, a more prolonged basis in communities across the country, both large and small. And as a consequence, demand for settlement workers and school service is spreading significantly uh, beyond major metropolitan areas. In 2023, there's also kind of a really, really substantial elephant in the room. I have the pleasure of working with different school divisions throughout Alberta, and I've noticed that you can't say this even in the tone of a whisper, which is learning loss. We know that the, um, the public health measures required to control the COVID-19 pandemic were substantial, dramatic. What is less commonly acknowledged is how precipitously they caused student learning outcomes to decline. And we have a really interesting data gap because relatively few um, relatively few schools have had full-scale testing brought back. Uh, that will probably come this June. So the measurement of learning loss has not necessarily been substantial, but it's, it's there. These are students who are likely to be lagging on educational indicators due to COVID-19 related disruptions. So that's lagging in reading, lagging in math, in younger children, lagging in social skills. And they will have had less classroom time and social development time for the same reason. In other words, these are children whose educational experience over the last several years has been significantly disrupted. And we have to be honest about the extent of that disruption.
Um, this is coming from a 2021 study that was published, and it said many children and youth have experienced disengagement, chronic attendance problems, declines in academic achievement, and decreased credit attainment during the pandemic, with the impact far deeper for those already at risk. And one of the interesting challenges that we have to think about when we think about Swiss is, excuse me, the reality of children and youth who are speaking a non-official language at home, whose parents have not been educated in the Canadian school system by virtue of having emigrated from somewhere else, who um, may be experiencing a whole cluster of factors that make education more challenging. And more often than not, children who were beginning with those challenge factors are going to need additional support to combat the learning loss that has occurred over the last several years of COVID. Again, you step into any classroom, any principal's office, this is not something that people are very eager to hear about, but it's really critically important to our understandings of how to support newcomer youth in the future. So let's talk a little bit about that. What does that actually happen to look like? One of the ideas I very often like to talk about with, um, with teachers in the classroom is actually comes from classical educational uh, philosophy, sociology, um, and it's created by a gentleman called um, Vygotsky, who's sort of turn of the 20th century, who talked about this idea of the zone of proximal development, ZPD or ZPD, I suppose. Um, zones of proximal development is more of a theoretical than a practical idea, but the, the theory is very sound. Essentially, there are three zones. There are things in the middle that you can do without any assistance at all. You're totally good to do it. You can manage, you're doing great. Then on the outermost ring, there are things that you can't do even with support. In the, in the middle ring, where most learning actually takes place, is this zone of proximal development between I can do this totally on my own and I can't do this at all. The reason why this is really relevant for uh, newcomer children and youth is this idea of what is the capacity that a child has brought with them when they come into a classroom, particularly when it comes to expectations of learning and the language associated with that. And this, I think, is one of the biggest challenges when we when we factor in demographic shift, when we factor in learning loss, when, and then when we factor in the other the other element of language, we have a really, really significant challenge that's highly relevant to zones of proximal development. And in essence, this is getting students from CLB1 to CLB five or six. So for those of you unfamiliar, um, here in Canada, we have uh, language the Canada language benchmark CLBs, which go from one really basic English to 12 perfect fluency. And if you are a child who's arrived into the country and you have not spoken English ever before in your life and you have a CLB of one, getting from CLB one to CLB five or six, a medium moderate competency can take years. Realistically, it does take years, between two and five years, depending on a variety of factors. Pre-arrival trauma, family circumstance, the level of support that that child has in their home, their feeling of skill, individual ability. Obviously, you know, it, it varies from person to person. And finally, free time. Is, is this a child who's able to dedicate all their time to, to learning and acquiring English? Or is this a young person who's expected to care for their younger siblings, expected to work to support the family, expected to be um, doing a lot of housework or supporting the family in many ways? So essentially, we're ending up in a circumstance where Children are coming into an environment where they have to dedicate years of their life to language acquisition, and the circumstances under which they acquire language may not necessarily, excuse me, be ideal. Sorry for the, the ringing. Um, based on the zones of proximal development, we really have to think about this idea of what you can do independently, what you can do with support, and what you simply cannot do with the resources that you currently have. So based on the zones of proximal development, a student with a CLB of two cannot write an essay about Louis Riel, even if they're guided, because their acquisition, their language capacity, their ability to engage, is just not there yet. Um, a student with a CLB of three cannot do assignments about linear algebra for, first time, for the first time in their second language, even if guided, because they don't yet have the language capacity to jump onto the more complex subject matter that is required in order to understand these higher order concepts. So when we think about emerging trends, the reality is that there will be more and more students in Canadian classrooms who are at these low CLB levels who require support to acquire English and then acquire the content that's required to pass, for example, secondary school. So this is a really significant theme in high schools across the country, to a lesser extent in junior high schools, because there's a, an axiom in, in education that I think is really helpful to think about. We say that until a student is in grade three, they're learning to read. After grade three, they're reading to learn, which is a really important distinction. And for students who studied for their first language in English, those years that normally would be dedicated to learning to read, learning to acquire language, to feel comfortable in the language, they've accelerated past those. And so now they're expected to learn to read and to read to learn concurrently. And that's a very heavy expectation to put on any student, ultimately requiring additional supports, additional needs.
Um, one of the things to talk about with teachers is kind of how they can maybe manage and mitigate this. What could they be learning right now today with the skills that they currently have that could be valuable? So acknowledging a student coming into your classroom with a CLB 3 out of 12 is probably not going to be able to write a reflection about a soliloquy in Macbeth. They may be able to look at vocabulary chunks. They may be able to practice sentence composition. They could read short or adapted passages about the material. But a lot of this is this idea of acknowledging that this is a trend and developing solutions so that the student can continue to learn, even if it's not in exactly the same manner as their classmates who spoke English as a first language. There's also an interesting advocacy role about at the school level, is this the best time for them to be attempting this? Is it really good to sit a student in the back of the class and listen about the War of 1812 when they don't yet have the, the language skills to touch down on any of the subject matter? Or is it better for them to have a school program that's adapted to suit their needs? Now, again, I work in rural schools, so we very seldom have the luxury of ESL classes or specifically structured classes intended for students with language learning needs. Um, mostly we're adapting kind of on the fly. But in either situation, there's a capacity to do targeted specific learning in the interest of the student based on the skills they have right now. Um, another element that I think is really critical when we think about these emerging trends is how is it that people are coming to Canada and what are the circumstances that have predated the child's arrival into Canada? Um, again, we have a much increased volume of newcomers that are coming to Canada, but I think the pathways through which people are settling in Canada are also increasingly diverse. Um, we have many, many tens of thousands of Ukrainians that have settled in the country. Um, they're in rural communities and urban communities, but they've also fled war and there's, and yet they're not formally refugees. They're not necessarily connected with formal support. So we have an emerging trend of a large cohort of people who've come to Canada who, who maybe have significant uh, additional needs and challenges and don't necessarily have the means to access those formalized supports. So that's another really critical trend to think of in the Swiss context. Um, is the family aware of all the supports that are available to them? Are they made to feel welcome in Canada? Um, I'd love to say that all the newcomer families that we support have felt welcome and supported in the schools, but the reality we know is that that's not always the case. Um, it's also really important to think about what the family considers the priorities for the child and what the child considers their own priority. Is school language learning and so on their focus, or are there other focuses that are taking away from their um, capacity to learn as effectively? And if that's the case, how can we be sure that those supports are available and, and ready? One of the things I always like to put to uh, to teachers in the Swiss context is this inquiry context. There's so much emphasis that's put on the skills or deficits of the student and not necessarily enough emphasis that's put on how teachers can inform themselves before even entering into the Swiss instance. So I started to ask, do you know what students, your what countries your students come from? The answer is not always yes. Um, the secondary question is, what is going on in those countries? What is the context uh, that, that the family left. Um, and you can feel that sometimes people have some discomfort in acknowledging this. But again, if we look at emerging trends, if we look at patterns of migration, we have to be honest about what people are likely to have experienced, or we can ask what they have actually experienced before arriving into Canada. What pathway did your students and families take to get here? And so I wanted to give an example. These are, these are two lived examples. If you were a Ukrainian family living in Odessa, in the west of Ukraine, beautiful, elegant city. You're living in Odessa. You go from Odessa to Berlin. You wait for your visa. And then from Berlin, you come to Edmonton. That's a very particular pathway that you've taken. Now, you will have experienced the trauma of displacement and possibly direct exposure to war. But your experience is very different than another Ukrainian family that we've supported who were living in Luhansk, which has been occupied by Russian forces since 2014. The family fled Luhansk for Belarus and came from Belarus to Edmonton. That's a family that's had direct exposure to war, that's had direct exposure to destruction of infrastructure, disruption of education, disruption of healthcare. That's a very different experience, even though those are two families that are fleeing from the same conflict. So how can we ensure that we're looking at these emerging trends, these big global trends, and then tailoring our programming to, to meet the needs of those students? Um, I've also put in a comment because it's not only about war. It's very different to be from Manila in the Philippines than it is to be from Mindanao. So one of the big details, and I think about this often, is this idea that we can't paint all newcomers, obviously, with the same broad brush. But the more refined the knowledge is within the institutions that serve newcomers, the more effective they will ultimately be in providing that service. Um, as I've often said to the teachers and support, you don't need to be an expert. But understanding context supports effective relationship building, and everything else can come from there. So um, 
I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, so again, thank you. I hope this has been a good overview of the uh, emerging themes and I'll throw it back to Carolee in the studio. Thanks.